this is Duke University. I have done these interviews with some dis distinguished Duke, Duke alums. I've done them with people who work at Duke, various academic leaders, but I also once upon a time interviewed Bill Gross, uh, the head of PIMCO, uh, one of the uh, then most respected voices on uh, 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 finance and its future in America. Once I interviewed Judy Woodruff, a great, one of the great political commentators and current cultural commentators, and now I come to another kind of celebrity that Duke has produced. Duke, a school so famous for athletes, so famous, dare I say, for having athletes who also graduate from college, uh, you know, uh, who are athletes and something else as well. Uh, well, it turns out that is itself a form uh, or, or an avenue to a form of celebrity and real cultural visibility in our culture, and few people have attained that celebrity at such a height or with so much to be proud of as Shane Battier. I'll just remind you of the details of his career, although it seems ludicrous for me to do so since everyone knows them. <coughs> uh, you know that he was born and raised in Michigan. You know he went to Detroit Country Day School, which in consequence of his presence won three state championships during the year he was enrolled there. And I was told you were called Mr. Basketball of Michigan in high school. Is this true? Uh, I wonder what the players at the college known as Michigan felt during that uh, period. <laughs> Uh, so then, of course, it was foredestined that you would go to Duke. You arrived at Duke in 1997 and instantly captured the heart of the university and became a standout both on the court and off. During your four-year career, you played in two Final Fours. In your senior year, Duke won the national championship against Arizona in 2001. And in that occasion... And in that occasion, you were chosen as the consensus winner of the uh, uh, National Player of the Year Award, the Naismith Award, the Wooden Award. You got an award, he won the award. Uh, <laughs> then he got out of college. Uh, it was thought he was a little too old to be competitive in the draft, but of course he went in the number one round of the draft uh, and was the sixth, uh, sixth uh, pick to play for the Memphis Grizzlies, where he began a very distinguished career in the, uh, uh, in the NBA. Uh, as you know, he was then uh, uh, traded to the Houston Rockets in the year 2006, and now he's... Shane, I want to tell you a secret. This is a really easy audience. <laughs> Where he not only has become a legendary and beloved player, uh, but also I think everybody in this town knows that he and his wife have become civic leaders as well as sports figures. Uh, and uh, uh, the Bettier Take Charge Foundation, which I hope we'll hear a little bit more about as this, uh, as this goes on, uh, is really, you know, you were a youth and now you're a little only slightly yes, less young, uh, but that's good of you to reach back from your success to people who might not have had the same means to success and give them uh, some a semblance of the chance you had. So Shane Battier, would you please come up on stage with me and I will now interrogate you. <laughs> well done, well done, well done. May I offer you a glass of water? I would love one, thank you. I am the full service president. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Uh, it's all I'm offering. <laughs> First of all, welcome everybody. Um, this is a little embarrassing for me when they say this is the largest Duke alumni event of, of Houston. Um, I don't do much, I don't do well with a lot of hype. This is what you get. And so I'm a little nervous uh, yeah, with, you with, this, with this setting, with this setting. You never sat around in the president's office in your no. Duke time? No, I <laughs> no. No. I'm, I'm very impressed by this though. I'm very impressed. Are you even a little intimidated? Uh, slightly. Well, let's work, let's see if we can work on that. <laughs> Well, let me just say, you are, as you know, one of the most beloved and admired people ever to have played basketball at Duke. Uh, and what that means is you not only are known as a figure, you're a person who really emblematized Duke for a, lot, for a lot of people. And I would just ask you, I won't ask you now, but I'll ask you, how old were you when you arrived at Duke? 
I was 19 years old. Okay, so what was it like at 19 to not only be yourself, but to emblematize a university? I mean, it must have had its pluses and minuses. Well, when you're 19 years old, you don't understand uh, your, your life consequences and the decisions that you make fully. Um, I first got interested in Duke because of Grant Hill. And a true story, growing up in Michigan, I was a big Fab Five guy. I didn't like Duke too much. <laughs> Christian Leitner, this is a true story. I see Christian Leitner now and I love him. What, you know, one of the greatest, Bobby Hurley. Yeah, not, not so much back in 1990. Um, and it wasn't until another guy who had a, a bad haircut, uh, kind of gangly and kind of geeky looking, Grant Hill, um, led Duke to the national championship game in 1994. And I said, you know what? That guy's pretty cool. I'm, I want to be him. Uh -huh. And to this day, the coolest thing about my life, I've done some really cool things, been around the world, but the fact that I can pull out my phone and have Grant Hill's cell phone in my, my phone, that's at the top of my list. So, so if it weren't for Grant Hill, I don't know if how we'd about, be how here about today. How about me? Imagine how I feel. I can, I can now call you up. Uh, well, but, so, well, no, but come well, on, tell, know, tell you, me a little more of the story. When you, when you, when you step on campus, th th there's so much tradition. And you, you really feel like you are part of, of something uh, historic and, and, and rich. That's right. And that was the deciding factor for me when I chose my colleges. And right. uh, I had a chance to go to any, any school in the country. Yes. But when I, when I stepped up, someone asked me, why, why Duke? And I, I remember the answer. Because when I stepped on campus, I, I saw the trees. And I just wanted to be with these trees and the buildings. <laughs> and the history, and the people. People were doing things there, and I wanted to do things. Um, and I know I would have had good, a great career of the universities, mm -hmm. would have won a lot of games, and hopefully made the NBA, but uh, for where I wanted to go in my life, um, right. I knew Duke would give me the best chance for that. And uh, I, I tell people all the time that when you're 17, 18 years old, you pray you make the right decision. And I, and I can unequivocally say that going to Duke was the best decision outside of marrying my wife uh, I've, I've made. He, sn he snuck that one right <laughs> in. That's good. That uh, good. So uh, yeah. it, it, it just, it, I'm, yeah. I'm lucky, I'm lucky. Well, I mean, it worked out incredibly well for you. Let me, so let me ask you, you know that I mean, you know that uh, for a lot of people, uh, playing basketball at the highest level of aspiration and going to university at the highest mm -hmm. level of aspiration are seen as competing goals rather than uh, uh, complementary goals. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think, do you see that as having changed since your own I college time? I think it's up to the individual. Yeah. I, I was lucky to have great parents who instilled in me there was a time to, to go to school. Right. And when you go to school, it's time to go to school. It's right. not time to socialize. It's not time to play basketball. It's time to focus on school. When it's time for basketball, it's, it's time for basketball. Mm -hmm. It's not time for school. It's mm -hmm. not time for socializing. When all that's done, okay, now it's time to socialize. And so I, I was instilled with that mindset at an early age. And so that was normal to me. And so when I got to Duke, uh, it's just what I did. I went to school every day, went to class. I went to basketball practice every day, and I still found time for my, my friends and, and for the social. Um, and there, you, you hear about the graduation rates now, and you hear about uh, just, it's appalling, really, um, especially with African-American athletes in college and basketball and football. Uh, but there, there are a lot of athletes who want to get education, who want to have the college experience, who want to do well in their sports, who want to do well in school. Uh, but that message gets lost in, in this statistic, and uh, it's, it's a travesty. Uh, but for, for me, it's, I, I felt that I would have shortchanged myself and my decision, and here I am at this great university. I'd be, I'd be wasting an unbelievable opportunity if I didn't take advantage of every opportunity mm -hmm. given to me in my time there. Tell me a little about Coach K. So Coach K must have spoken to you for the first time when you were 18 or 17? Oh, my first conversation, yeah, 16 years old. I think 16? I, I, re I received my first letter uh, from Coach K when I was 13 years old. <laughs> Imagine I, that. 
I guess he, I guess so he was busy when you so were one through twelve. Imagine your your, your thirteen-year-old life. You're getting excited for the seventh-grade dance. <laughs> your hormones going crazy. You know, it, you're, you don't know up from down. You're excited to watch cartoons on Saturday morning, and here I am getting a letter <laughs> from from Coach K. Uh huh. But for me, that was normal. Uh, so I had a, a little bit of a skewed uh, yeah. uh, adolescence, if you will. Uh, uh -huh. But at the same time, it was, it was flattering. I mean, my dad uh -huh. still has a box of all the. I think my dad enjoyed the recruiting process more than I did. Probably. I, 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 it was a necessary evil for me. But my dad still has the box of letters in the basement because um, he was the big cheese and everyone wanted to talk to him. But uh, uh, Coach K, uh, I, I love him. The, the second you meet him, you're, you're, you're awed by, he, he's got a presence. He has a presence about him. Well, you know, see, I think of that the reason he belongs at a university is that I see him fundamentally as a teacher. Yes. Right, that a coach is, a, is or can be a form of teacher. It's yes. continuous with other things. Yes. And so he's a talent developer. He finds talent and then helps you find the way to develop that talent, yes. which I would suppose is the essence of teaching. Yes. So how did he teach you? How did he help you find your talent? I mean, can you articulate it at all? Coach K's greatest strength is taking talented individuals and getting them to do two things on the basketball court. Play harder than anybody else and play more together mm -hmm. uh, than anybody, in, anybody else. When you have talent, you win a lot of games. <laughs> a lot of games. Mm -hmm. And uh, the beauty of Coach is that he really tries to understand what makes you tick mm -hmm. and understand what motivates you. And uh, for me, I'm, I'm not a guy who responds well to yelling. I got yelled at one time in my four years, one time. And I will, I'm sure I, everyone wants to hear about it. Uh, uh, 19, gosh, 1998. We're number one team in the country. We go to Carolina, they're number two. It was, it was a pretty big game. I mean, they, they, it, the game was, it was uh, a little above my station at the time. We go to Carolina and we end up losing by 15, 16 points. It wasn't, wasn't that close. And uh, it was the only game we lost. I lost in four years by double digits. Well, next day at practice, it was not fun. <laughs> it was not fun. And when Coach K was recruiting me and telling me, whispering sweet nothings in my ear right. as a high school senior, uh, I think I was sold a, a bad bill of goods because this is not what I signed up for the day after the Carolina game. <laughs> and I'll never forget it because the only time in four years I got yelled at. And to this day, I think that's the only time I've been yelled at. Uh, he goes down the line and, and uh, puts, puts it in a, in a, in a very uh, uh, distinct manner of everyone's flaws for the games. And he gets to, to me and says, and Battier, and Battier, I'm Mr. All-American. Everybody loves me. I'm a good guy. I'm so nice. And I probably can't, it's being filmed, so I probably can't repeat what he said to that. But, uh, but needless to say, uh, my, my, my niceness and my, my gentleman skills were not welcome on the court. And uh, it was best if I left that in the dorm room. Um, but to, to his credit, um, it, it was to the point. I understood where he's coming from. And I made sure I never made those mistakes again. Well, that's impressive. Okay, that's education. That yeah, is education. <laughs> uh, well, uh, one uh, <laughs> Sunday morning, I opened the New York Times. In the New York Times Magazine, I found this fascinating article on you by Michael Lewis. Uh, and so here's somebody trying to get in your head. Uh, and you, if, you, I'm sure everybody in this room read the article. It's incredibly interesting. It's called something like, do I have the name right? The no stat all star. Yes. Uh, the point being that you're not going to be the person with the best statistics on the team, but that every team you play on, everyone else does better. And every team you play against, everyone else does worse. Uh, and if you read the article, what's really interesting is the article suggests that this is because you're unselfish. And that might sound like a moral virtue. But then the article goes way beyond that. It suggests <laughs> that actually it's a form of intelligence, of using your mind in the presence of the game to make something happen. So what was it like? You know, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to read about myself in these terms uh, in the New York Times. But I realize there's small, <laughs> small danger of that happening. But. Uh, <laughs> Well, it, it, was a, uh, it, was, it was a fascinating journey. Uh, Michael Lewis obviously wrote the article, and he's a fantastic writer. 
He's a fantastic writer. Fantastic sure. writer. He, he made me sound much cooler than I actually am, which is his <laughs> greatest, greatest skill. Uh, but uh, when I was approached uh, by my general manager who had a relationship with Michael Lewis, he asked me, do you want to be on the cover of the New York Times Magazine? I'm like, all right, yeah, cool. <laughs> Michael Lewis is doing the article, all right, cool. Um, and so it was a, actually a very intensive um, interview process over many, many months, yeah. many film sessions. Michael Lewis wanted to get in uh, in, into my mind and, so, and sort of see the, the game the way that I see it and to uh, not to uh, bore you with, with geek stats and, and whatnot, which has become my life. Um, <laughs> basically, I, I'm trying to use the inefficiencies of my opponent against him uh, and in turn it'll give us, our, our team and uh, myself, the best chance of, of defending the player and winning the basketball game, and uh, a lot, obviously, a lot more goes into that. Uh, but it was it was a fascinating experience for me because I never really looked at myself constructively. I understand. Um, I knew what I what I did, and I know what I do. And to me, again, it's it's normal. And sure, that's right. I happen to be pretty good at it, and I'm stuck around ten years, so something obviously has been working, but. To, right. To try to put it into words for somebody else and to read it on, on paper uh, was, was really fascinating for me and it's something I'm, I'm really proud of. And uh, I, got, I gained a lot of mileage off the article, so I have Michael Lewis to, uh, to thank. Well, I mean, it's really an attempt to explain sports as a cerebral activity. Yeah. Uh, that that's to say that the physical attributes of people gets them so far, but then there's a mental dimension. Yes. And I've seldom seen anybody try to, a to analyze the mental dimension yeah. in as much detail. Well, it's, it's a relatively new field. It's a relatively new field. Uh, Michael Lewis wrote a, a baseball book ba uh, called Moneyball, which is based on baseball saber metrics, which is sort of the same thing that we're trying to do here in basketball. Uh, but it was the precursor for uh, what we're trying to do. We have a brilliant GM, uh, Daryl Morey, who went to MIT and, and Northwestern and has a great math background. And, M MIT is famous for its basketball traditions. Yes. <laughs> he would tell you it is. Uh, so go, fi go figure. <laughs> um, that's good. Uh, <laughs> get me in trouble, but that's good. Um, and the way I try to explain it uh, to, to people who don't really follow it is it's sort of like uh, going to Vegas and, and playing the blackjack table. If, you know, I hear they have it out there. and It's a game of odds. Right. And basically right. you're, you're, you're playing the, the house odds. Mm -hmm. And you, you, there are certain situations where you can improve your odds of uh, having success if you do a certain thing. And so, but so I'm told you actually have access. Is it true that you alone have access to certain statistics about the games? I, and your I, opponents? I ask for more. I ask for more. We, everyone gets the same statistics. Right. Um, I, I would rather be overprepared versus yeah. underprepared. So I, I ask for some special stats that That's if great. I gave to you, you would uh, think I'm crazy. But it makes sense to me. That's good. Okay. Well, let me take a little segue uh, in the direction of your foundation. Uh, you know, you didn't get very far in your professional career before you uh, showed your desire to give back as well as to receive. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would just be interested, I truly would be interested in hearing you talk a little bit about your, the philosophy, the strategy of your foundation. Uh, my wife and I have been very, very blessed. And I wouldn't be here without opportunity. Mm -hmm. I feel very, very strongly about that. And um, we have a, a creed, and uh, I just learned this last couple of, of years. A friend told me, and, and it totally made sense. It sort of summed up my, my life philosophy. Um, do well, do good. Do well, do good. The two should go hand in hand. And I've been very, very fortunate to play 10 years in the NBA and, and do very well for myself. Well, it's my responsibility to, to, to help others. Um, and we've been blessed to give. We've been blessed to be given a platform where we can touch lives. Um, but regardless of the platform, we all have a duty. We have a civic duty to, to give back, give your time, give your energy, uh, give your money uh, to to help others, give others opportunity. And uh, that's something that 
um, I will do to, to my last day on, on this, this earth, uh, because I, I feel that strongly about it. So then I heard about another form of that activity that involves Duke, because uh, my colleagues in the Global Health Institute are, are very concerned, as is everybody in this country, with uh, the issue of obesity, the growth, of the growth of obesity, growth of diabetes, epidemics of diabetes. And you know that this is now an issue, un almost unbelievably, in countries that did not have enough food to feed their population now have problems of obesity. Yes. Yes. Uh, as in China, where 1.3 billion people, if you have a, po a, a, a problem of obesity, it's going to have mm -hmm. massive dimensions. Uh, and I hear that you have been in conversation with uh, my colleagues at Duke yes. about doing things to promote fitness and health, for instance, in China. Yes, uh, it's, it's a very exciting opportunity. It's still in the, the infant stages, but I was approached by Dr. Uh, Dr. Mike Merson and Dr. Gary Bennett of Duke, uh, who, are, who are doing great things in the Duke Global Health Program, um, about my possible involvement with their programs in China. And to give you a little background, um, for as, as famous as I think I am in America, I'm 20 times more famous in China. <laughs> random story, very random. Uh, when I got traded to Houston, I was approached by a Chinese shoe manufacturer named Peak. Uh, you've probably never heard of it. They don't sell in America. They may, I don't know. Um, to be their international spokesperson. So I was a free agent at the time. And uh, I said, OK, well, I'm up for a, a ride, a new adventure. And so I decided to, to go to China and uh, be international spokesperson for peak shoes. And what I didn't know is when I went over there, um, I was the only guy, I, I was filming commercials. I'm walking into a, a market in Guangzhou, China, cities you've never heard of, I've, I've been to. And I, I see a 50-foot billboard of, of me standing like this. <laughs> and I, I say, what <laughs> alternative universe am I living in? And if you, go to, if you actually go to China right now, the, on the, uh, the, the sports center of China, uh, Channel 6, uh, my commercial runs literally 20 to 25 times a day. For every NBA game, every commercial break, they go to commercial. They show my commercial, they show another commercial, they show my commercial again, <laughs> and they go back to the game. So some would say there's oversaturation of my brand um, in China. And so if anyone uh, needs anything <laughs> in China, I'm your guy. <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, so this has been the fifth year I've worn the shoe, and it's been great. It's been, really been a fantastic experience, and uh, I, I've gone over every summer. I've gone over there seven times, and um, I really f felt I've, I've, I've come to know the country, and um, as my career is winding down now, um, I would love to find a way to stay connected with, with China and, and stay connected with the, the people I've, I've come to meet. And when I was presented with the Duke Global Health Institute, Opportunity. This is, this is a great way to stay involved um, with Duke, with China, and uh, diabetes is a huge epidemic in obesity in America. Well, uh, for those who've been to China, they know that the, the diet of, of people in China is, is very poor and high in saturated fats and salts, and the, and the heart attack rates and the stroke rates are, are off the charts compared to. Uh, what's, what's in America. And so, um, drawing on my athletic background, uh, I think it'd be great just to promote physical education, raise awareness in China as, as well in America. Uh, because it's, this is... This it, is see, it's completely good. incredible. And for uh, me, it's just the perfect Duke story. Now, I realize that Duke is really <laughs> a little wrong to lay claim to this. Uh, but nevertheless, and here you are, you're a famous athlete. So, your, your, your physical fitness, but then also your image gives you the ability to speak as an image. You know, images are usually silent. But here, yeah. you, you get to be the spokesperson yes. for, uh, for, for health, for a philosophy of living in the face yes. of new challenges. Uh, uh, so there it is. Which is, which is great. It's exciting. Yeah, which is great. It's exciting. Which is great. So I have two more questions for you, then we'll take a couple from the floor, and then we can go back to the party. Uh, okay, so uh, how, 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 how can I even ask this one? <laughs> okay. In the, in the event that you don't play in the NBA forever, <laughs> what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Uh, I think we're doing pretty good. I think we should take our act on the road. That's a good idea. Yes. I'm... <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's get a semi. Just pack this up. That was the first one. A little ham, a little egg. Okay. You ready for my next question? <laughs> <laughs> Is that the best you're going to do on that one? That's okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll stay tuned. We'll stay tuned. Well, I mean, I, I, I figure we're getting a glimpse of possible future use 
in the stuff you talk about with the Global Health Program, that yeah. you're, you've achieved a certain visibility that actually gives you the power to be a spokesman in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just, it'll be interesting to watch you explore those and test them out. Well, whatever I do, I'll, I'll be in a position to help That's people. Right. Yes, you will. I feel passionate That's about right. helping people and uh, I want to live my philosophy. Do yes. well, do good. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so here's the last question, and this I know will annoy you, but it is the night before <laughs> election night. Uh, and I only want to say, when I first went to Duke, everybody said to me, everybody who ever mentioned the name Shane Battier, <laughs> there was always one other sentence that immediately followed it, which is, you know, he's going to be president of the United States. Okay, like <laughs> Shane Battier, he's going to be president of the United States. Oh, did you ever hear about Shane Battier? He's going to be president of the United States. Let me tell you something about Shane Battier. Not everyone knows this, but he's going to be president of the United States. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so here it is. It's the day before election day. There's not uh, a presidential election. Yes. Uh, yeah. do, 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 does that have any interest for you? Well, I've, I've, I've deflected. It, it, admittedly, I've, it would solve your, that's the number, that's solve the your career challenge. That's the number one question I get. That's the number one question okay. that I get. Are you, are you going to throw your hat into the political ring? That's, you know, I have two answers until tonight. Uh, the only place I'm running in the near future is up and down that court. OK. OK. Um, <laughs> But I've deflected the question, and you know I want to use okay. this as a forum uh, for my, my Duke friends, and I have great classmates at Duke that I've been mulling this over, and uh, I don't know about the legalities of it yet, but um, we're going to try to go bigger than, than the office of the president. We're thinking maybe running for king <laughs> or emperor. I know. I, know, I, I don't know the legalities. I got people working on it. It's not, it's not, usually, um, it's not usually pursued through elective I, Well, those are minor details, right? You have to have a dream first. Uh, I understand. You know, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, okay. I, I, if I could be in a position where I can help people and, uh, and that's the, the best avenue, then um, we'll see. We'll see. A typical alumnus of Duke University. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we take a few questions. Yeah. <laughs> or not. <laughs> what eight years? You five, been in, in, five years. Five years. Five years. Uh, of course, you went to Memphis, and you're from Michigan. But once you retire. Where do you think you will call home? That's a great question. Um, I should you should probably ask my wife that, because um, I'm, I'm merely, the, merely the CFO. She is the CEO. Um, I, I really love Texas. Texas is great. Austin's a great city. Houston's a great city. Uh, we, we've talked about staying here in Houston. Uh, we, we have a, just a great uh, group of friends and a, and a great uh, civic base here in Houston and in Texas. The weather's fantastic. Um, um, I don't know. I think a lot will depend on where I uh, decide to, to, to throw my head into the next, uh, next career. Um, right. But um, we'll see. We'll see. But I, I, love, I love being a, a Texan. Good. Good. I'm scanning. I'm scanning. Shane, is coaching in your future? <laughs> um, I, I would love to coach high school. Honestly, my dream is to be a high school defensive coordinator for football. That, that's, I love football. I love football. I am a, I really do. I think I'd be a good defensive coordinator. Um, send, basketball. Send, send your applications around. <laughs> but uh, I would love to coach my son in, in basketball. If he decides to play basketball, he, he can do whatever he wishes. Um, it's, it's tough to, to coach on this level. Um, I know how hard I worked, and I know my commitment uh, to, to team and uh, to winning. Um, when, I, when I don't feel that same commitment from the guys who I potentially coach, I think that would really eat, up, eat me up, and uh, uh, it'd be very, very difficult for me to, to, uh, to swallow that. Um, and so I, I don't think that I could be a college or, or pro coach, um, well, but we'll see. I'd like to... High school defensive coordinator for football. <laughs> Start there. <That's> <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Uh, I enjoy hearing about you and your background. I'm interested in your foundation. What's involved in getting involved with your foundation? 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're really excited about it. It's called the Bad EA Take Charge Foundation, and we have a website, uh, takechargefoundation.com. Um, our lovely um, executive director, Ms. Newell Fleming, is here tonight. So if you have any questions, please see uh, my wife or, or Newell uh, Fleming after the, eve, after the evening is done. And um, my wife and I feel very strongly about uh, college education, and uh, my wife was a former teacher in Memphis, and so we are looking for strong leaders um, and kids who just need an opportunity, an opportunity. And last year was our first year of uh, fundraising, the first year of a, of a private foundation. We've had a foundation for the last eight years. Uh, last year we went private, and we're now in the, in the fundraising mode uh, to where we can really make a difference. Right now we have four kids in the program, three kids from Houston, uh, three great kids from Houston, uh, one, uh, one student from uh, Detroit, where my wife and I are both from, and we are looking to rapidly uh, expand uh, the program and just, just give kids a, a chance. And uh, uh, we're, this is not just a, a, a figurehead foundation. This is something I'm very active in, my wife's very active in. We interview the kids personally and, uh, and follow up, send the kids care packages, and uh, we really, just really want to uh, do the right thing. Uh, for some, some great kids who just need a chance. And so uh, our big event, uh, of course, we are, we're always open to donations. Um, our big event, April 7th, please mark on your calendars, the, the Battier Take Charge Night presents Clutch City Karaoke. Um, <laughs> that must be I'm, pretty, I'm surprised you haven't heard of this. I'm surprised you haven't uh, heard of this. That must be pretty near the Final Four. It is. Uh, April 7th, right uh, around the Final Four. Have you four. thought of packaging the tickets? Uh, we, we could. <laughs> There we go. We could. I think um, we've got it. I think but, we've got uh, it. But the, the, the karaoke event is downtown at the Majestic Metro. Uh, I get my entire team to sing karaoke. Some of the Houston Texans sang last year, some of the Houston Astros, and we raised uh, over $100,000, and everyone had a great time. So put that, put that in your calendar now. Tickets are going to go really quickly. You could see me on stage um, singing. It's good. <laughs> it's good. It's good. Well, let's break this up and return to the party, but I would just say, uh, I think the takeaway for this evening is do well, do good, yes. go Duke. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.